Hi, welcome to Teapot Genies. This Irish episode, we're going to the Tipperary Family History Research Centre. This is the Family History Centre that's been causing so much controversy on the net. It sure is. So watch the episode and make up your own mind. Okay, I understand there's a jail there that you toured, where they transported convicts to this very spot. That's right, and also to America. Patrick McDonald and the staff at the Tipperary Family Research Centre were most helpful. They made this into a very interesting episode, and I hope you enjoy it. We travelled on to Tipperary through the many narrow, winding, enchanting little streets. We visited the Tipperary Family History Research Centre and we interviewed Patrick at the local jail. Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about the jail? The jail here, called the Bridewell, is uh, a replacement for the original jail in the town. It started uh, its life in 1837 uh, as a result of the inadequacy of the existing jail which had been complained about from the 1820s. The jail itself comprised 16 cells, 12 for male prisoners, 4 for female prisoners and 2 outside cells for drunkards. Uh, the jail was completed and opened in 1842. Patrick, would some of the Irish convicts have been housed here before they were transported to Australia and America? Yes, the, uh, the jail here would have been used as a holding place for people on remand for, for crimes which might have resulted in transportation and also as a local jail for people uh, accused of being drunk and disorderly or for very minor offences. So people would have been held here for a short period of time before being brought to one of the larger court buildings or one of the larger jails for trial and subsequent transportation to Australia. Patrick, can you tell us a bit about these walls? Yes, the, uh, the outer wall, which you can see is quite high, is the boundary wall of the jail and went all the way around the, the jail building, uh, basically to keep the prisoners in. Uh, the inner wall is the wall that separates uh, the work areas away from the, the actual exercise area. So if you like, this was the exercise yard of the prison. Mm. Uh, people would have been able to, to walk here, but this was as far as they could actually go. The wall went all the way around the building and there was a very substantial set of gates which enabled the, the governor to make sure that the prisoners actually stayed in the prison. Uh, on the other side of the wall there was a, an exercise, uh, sorry, a, a um, work area where people would be able to grow vegetables and manufacture small products for, for sale locally which all supported uh, their stay in jail and enabled them to be fed and, and kept. The Tipperary Family Research Centre, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, we are a diocesan centre which is uh, slightly different from most of the other centres that you will have come across in Ireland in that the records that we have access to are not for a county. They are actually for the Archdiocese of Cashel and Emily. So that we have access to the church's records uh, rather than records uh, of births, deaths and marriages. It's baptismal and marriage records that we uh, search through. And uh, we're fortunate that the Archdiocese has given us access to all of its records up to the year 1900. And we have actually indexed all of those and placed them onto a computer database which enables us to do searches on any criteria so we can search for whatever information based on whatever information people are able to provide us with and then use that as a means of finding what information we can for them. So um, one difficulty that people have in Tipperary is that there are actually three centres in Tipperary because Tipperary is the largest inland county in Ireland. We have a, a centre in North Tipperary covering the northern part of County Tipperary, a centre in South Tipperary covering the south part of Tipperary and we also have the diocesan centre which covers the greater part of Tipperary and part of Eastern Limerick. Uh, the boundaries of church and state don't coincide. Mm. Uh, so sometimes you, you can find that you have to search in two or sometimes even three places before you find mm. a record for somebody who you thought was from Tipperary. Yeah. Who decided what was going to be the diocesan boundary as opposed to the 
county boundary, wouldn't it have been easier if they just made it the same? Well, for the purposes of genealogical research, it would have been an awful lot easier if the boundaries actually did coincide. And in fact, they do on the eastern edge. The boundary between the Diocese of Cashel and Emily is the same as the boundary between uh, Tipperary and Kilkenny boundary with, uh, of Cash and Emery with Oss Ossery, its adjoining uh, diocese. However, the church boundaries go back further than the county boundaries. Um, uh, they, they have been in existence for many hundreds of years. Uh, and, you know, a lot of centres, they divided things up by county. Because we were established by the diocese themselves, they stuck with their own boundary. And other centres came along subsequent to that and uh, adopted different boundaries. Can you tell us what record you actually have available for research and also any interesting stories that are, you've come across in your time? Well, the database that we have created, which took 12 years to actually develop, uh, has just over 600,000 records um, in it now. And because of the, the computer database system that we created, uh, we are able to do a search for any name within that database in you know literally it will take a couple of seconds for the result to come up which doesn't mean that it takes a couple of seconds to do a search unfortunately because you can still take days digging to find the right information because quite often people's information is not as accurate as they imagine that it is if somebody comes to us and says that they have uh, a John Ryan who was born on the 14th of March 1837, we generally search five years either side of 1837. If they have a John Ryan born in 1837 but no date, we'll tend to go seven to ten years on either side. Just because people's idea of time and the importance of dates and times, their ideas were very different back then. Uh, and people are always amazed at how many Irishmen, for example, in America, were born either on the 17th of March or the 4th of July, because it was just a convenient date for them to put down in the paperwork, because they didn't actually know themselves the date of their birth. It wasn't important. Um, out of the 600,000 records that we have, we have 46,500 Ryans which means that about one person in 12 in our area is called Ryan. Uh, we had a wonderful young lady come in one afternoon on her way back to Shannon Airport to catch a plane, uh, wondering if we could help her search for her granddad, Ryan. And uh, we gave her a form to fill in to get all the information she had. And having given us her name and her address and her email address, she was stumped by the name of the person she wanted to research him. We said, well, you said Grandad Ryan. What was his first name? And she said, Grandad. <laughs> now, did you find him? Uh, <laughs> subsequently, we did. But at the time, we could only narrow it down to about 25,000 possibles. Uh, but when she went home, she did a little bit more research and did come back to us with names and, and dates and marriages and children's names. So we were able to, to find him and find his siblings and his parents. and a lot of other information for her, but obviously the more information that somebody has to start off with, then the more likely they are to find the right person. Sometimes if the information is very vague, the answer can, can't be a very exact, it has yeah. to be slightly vague as well. Okay, well thank you Patrick, and if anybody out there is wanting some research done in the Tipperary area, contact the Tipperary Family History Research Centre. We headed off to visit the Tipperary Irish Famine Grave, where we had an interesting encounter, but more about that